Tonight, after weeks of intense debate within regulatory agencies over booster shots, new guidance has been released. And we'll examine the health of the American and global economy and what it means for your wallet. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later, our special guest will be Nathan Kaufman, the Vice President and Omaha Branch Executive of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. And you at home, you're a very important part of our show. We invite you to call in with your questions and share your experiences at 877-731-6733. We will be opening up our phone lines in just a little bit, but first, let's get right to the latest data. Dr. Gold, thank you for joining us as always, for always being here for us. What are the latest numbers as far as the spread of COVID-19 across the country tonight? You know, I think, Christina, if we had to sum it up in a single phrase, I would say the news is good. Uh, it's not great, but let's dig into the data and let me put a little color around that message. If we start off by looking at some of the global trends, uh, you can see that we're now under 500,000 cases per day. Hard to believe we'd ever be saying that, but that is the statistic, uh, which is 15% down over the last 14 days. Similarly, at 8,000 deaths over the last 24 hours globally, we are 9% down, or just over uh, 4.7 million deaths uh, have occurred. If we start to look at the map of the world, uh, you can see that the United States still remains brightly colored, uh, including uh, the Caribbean islands, uh, small parts of Central America, and just a tiny little area uh, in South America. There are still parts of the Middle East, uh, parts of Southern Africa, and of course the European continent that are seeing high case transmission rates as well. When we start to dig down into the United States, uh, we can see similar favorable trends. Uh, of course, we're over 42,000 aggregated confirmed cases and, to, and over 115,000 confirmed in the last 24 hours. But that is also about 18% down uh, over the last 14-day period. Hospitalization is down about 15%. And remember, several weeks ago, we were at about 125,000 Americans being hospitalized and we're now at about 86,000. Of course, if that's a family member or a friend, loved one or a colleague, that's one too many. And similarly, uh, the deaths, unfortunately, are still over 2,000 confirmed deaths. Death rate, use of ventilators, et cetera, are lagging indicators. And you can see while total cases and hospitalizations are down, the death rate is actually up 23% in the United States over the last 14 days. When we look at the map, uh, it tells a very similar story, and that is that the areas that we were most concerned about in the last several weeks, all through Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, parts of Texas, uh, et cetera, have shifted. And as the temperature begins to cool uh, and as the virus begins to spread more widely across the country, and of course we're talking about predominantly Delta variant, what we can see is that Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia uh, are now heating up, incredibly so. But look at what's going on in Wyoming, Montana, uh, in Oregon, uh, and Washington, uh, parts of Nevada. Again, uh, seeing very high case transmission rates. And, you know, we've never really talked about Alaska that much, but Alaska currently has some of the highest case transmission rates per capita, per 100,000 uh, uh, in the United States. Indeed, if we look at some of these numbers, uh, you can see the U.S., uh, which was at about 45 cases per 100,000 per day over the last several weeks, is now down about 20 percent, uh, which is 36 per 100,000 per day. But look at Alaska at 143 per 100,000 per day. Wyoming, 96. <clears throat> West Virginia, 93. Montana, 85 two and a half to three times the U.S. average uh, case transmission rates. Fortunately, the southern states have completely uh, disappeared from those top transmission rates. And even when we look at the total number of cases uh, per 100,000 per day, 
what we can see is that it appears that this fourth spike, this Delta variant spike, uh, has begun to really diminish uh, by a significant amount across the entire country. But obviously, there are still parts that are very much on the upward swing and will continue to be as we move forward. When we look at hospitalizations, again, 26 per 100,000 per day, uh, down about 15 percent since the last time that we spoke. But West Virginia is about twice that. Kentucky and South Carolina are nearly twice that, as is Georgia. And so hospitalization, intensive care, and death rates, of course, are the lagging indicators uh, of viral spread in our nation. We still are and have been a nearly 100 percent Delta variant. I'm sure we'll have a few minutes through our audience questions to talk about some of the new variants that are being identified around the world and what that means. But right now, uh, as we look at uh, the total percentage of diagnoses and sequencing, and if we look at the 10 healthcare districts, uh, as demonstrated by the United States Department of Health and Human Services, other than a very small slip, typically under 1%, we are dealing extensively with Delta variant uh, in the U.S. Moving on, uh, let's look at hospitalizations per day. And as you see, we have started to see an inflection point. Again, uh, not in all states, but certainly in average across the United States based on a seven-day running average. And now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the death rates. Again, they are still rising. They were up totally about 20 percent, between 20 and 25 percent per 100,000 per day to about 0.61. But look at some of the southern states where we've seen a real drop-off in the total number of new cases. But, of course, death rates are lagging indicators by anywhere between two and four weeks. So Alabama is still looking at about 2.3 per 100,000 per day. Florida, South Carolina, Alaska, all one and a half to two and a half times the, uh, the state uh, U.S. average of deaths per 100,000 uh, per day. You look at ICU capacity, again, the use of intensive care units is a lagging indicator. This map will continue to change as we see new cases continue to expand uh, in Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, and of course, the changes that we're seeing in Wyoming, uh, Idaho, Montana. And again, these are in both our rural and our urban communities. There is no question that our farming and ranching communities are being deluged by the spread of Delta variant, as are our larger cities across the country as well. When we look at deaths per day, again, uh, there is no sign that this is plateauing. And that, again, hopefully is because this is a lagging indicator. But the likelihood is this curve will continue to rise, at least for some time in the future, still exceeding 2,000 cases uh, of death uh, per day. And you may remember that just last week uh, we reported on this show that we exceeded the total confirmed death toll of the 1918 flu pandemic, which historically was the single largest cause of death in the history of the United States, exceeding the American Civil War and exceeding all of our world wars, thus making COVID-19 the single largest episode of the cause of death uh, in our nation. And as they say in the trade, uh, it's not over yet. When we look at some of our smaller counties, be they in Alabama, Kentucky, uh, Montana, uh, West Virginia, you remember we're at about 35 cases per 100,000 per day. Uh, look at the explosive growth in these communities, uh, making the point that although the total number of cases are small, the very rapid change is still occurring uh, in these small microcosms of spread that typically result from athletic events, social events, uh, spiritual events, and other such things that trigger some of the very, very contagious Delta variant uh, to spread uh, through the community. Just a quick look at the vaccine status uh, before I toss it back to you, Christina, uh, to say that, of course, our nation, 55%. Uh, of our population all in, this is all ages, uh, are fully vaxxed. Of those 12 and over, 65% uh, are fully vaxxed. Uh, of those 18 and up, 66%. And of those over 65, some of our most vulnerable, 
93% have had at least one dose and 83% are fully vaxxed. And so why don't we start taking some of our questions and we can dig deeper into this information uh, in response to our audience, your questions as well. Wow. I mean, I don't think that anybody at the beginning of the pandemic was able to see that 688,000 lives would be lost in this country. And that's just at this point, like you mentioned, we're still not done. Now, when you take a look at that map and the Delta variant, it really seems to be concentrated in the southeast. It seems to be migrating, though, to other parts of the country as well. It really set us back after it felt like we were gaining significant ground and slowing down the pandemic. Are there any new variants that we should be particularly concerned about tonight? Well, you know, Christina, a day doesn't go by or maybe even a week uh, without hearing about a new variant being identified in South America, in, uh, in somewhere in Africa, in the Middle East, the Far East, etc., and including in the United States. You know, with the total amount of sequencing that is going on across the world right now, we're constantly identifying minor changes in the genetic sequence. And of course, there have been named new variants, the Lambda variant, the Mu, that would be capital M-U uh, variant, and others that have yet to be given the uh, justification of a World Health Organization Greek letter name. Uh, thus far, none of them have been confirmed to be more contagious than Delta variant or have higher risk of vaccine breakthrough that has been confirmed scientifically. Now, there are significant changes in some of the genetic code, which translates into some of the changes of the protein structure on the surface of these variant viruses. Those changes may be, underscore may be, significant enough to enhance transmission, and unfortunately may be significant enough, particularly the changes in the spike protein, uh, to allow more breakthrough of vaccines and more reinfection of individuals that have been previously infected with COVID-19. All of that research is being pulled together, but right now uh, the Delta variant uh, first demonstrated, uh, of course, during the incredible spread uh, in India, that's the B1652.2 variant, to go back to the original name, uh, seems to be the predominant spread uh, worldwide. Uh, hopefully, if that continues to be the case, our vaccines will be very effective currently, and our antivirals, including the ones that are actively under development, uh, will turn out to be effective as well. You know, the Delta variant really underscored the importance of booster shots, but there was a little bit of confusion about booster shots. Let's talk about that for a moment because the head of the CDC, Rochelle Walensky, recently overruled a recommendation from the agency's outside advisory board, and she's now endorsing COVID-19 booster shots for frontline workers. But why was the advisory board reluctant about this decision, and why did she have to overrule it to begin with? Yeah, so this is a very complex process, and it's probably worth just a little bit of history for our audience to understand this. So the way this has worked during the pandemic, at least, as it relates to what's called emergency use authorization, or uh, uh, EAU, uh, the company, in this case Pfizer, comes to the Food and Drug Administration and says, we've completed a clinical trial, here's the data. The Food and Drug Administration looks at the data, uh, checks it, uh, does everything they can to determine accuracy, asks critical questions of the manufacturer, obviously has helped design the clinical trial, and then they send it out to an advisory committee known as the ACIP. Uh, this advisory committee of experts looks at it and says, we recommend the following to the Food and Drug Administration. They are not a, a governance body. They are an advisory body uh, to the Food and Drug Administration. They recommended booster shots of Pfizer product for individuals that were over six months vaccinated uh, that had high-risk medical conditions uh, who are immunocompromised, et cetera, and for those individuals uh, that were over uh, age 60 or 65. And uh, that recommendation went to the Food and Drug Administration, who then considered it, re-reviewed the data, and then agreed with the recommendation of the advisory committee 
and sent that out, including uh, frontline healthcare workers, teachers, and others. The recommendation then went to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, who also has an advisory committee on experts, and they weighed the recommendations of the ACIP, uh, of the FDA, and they came up with a somewhat different recommendation. Again, the vote was split, but they came up with a recommendation for uh, over age 65, for people with pre-existent uh, immunocompromised medical conditions, uh, for individuals that had received, again, this is only for Pfizer vaccine, and for individuals that had been vaccinated more than six months ago. And so that left uh, out the frontline healthcare workers, frontline teachers, those people who are essential to uh, maintaining uh, our kids in school, those people that are essential, frankly, to the workforce of our uh, organizations, uh, of hospitals, clinics, and so many others. And so what the director did, uh, Dr. Walensky, who, by the way, is an extremely experienced uh, uh, infectious diseases physician, uh, also from the Harvard system, uh, uh, reviewed that with her internal experts and then made a recommendation to mirror what the Food and Drug Administration uh, came out with. Now, I, you know, this, this is just uh, Jeff Gold's personal opinion. I think that's an inevitability over time, whether it's done altogether or whether it's done at a later time. I do believe that protecting the frontline healthcare workers uh, is a very important thing to do. I think protecting our teachers, particularly our teachers, you know, don't forget that a lot of our school kids who are under age 12, uh, which is uh, all of uh, you know the lower school and the middle school kids are still unvaccinated uh, in school and are although not getting hospitalized too often uh, are the highest risk for contracting and spreading COVID. And if we really want to keep our kids in school and if we really want to keep our hospitals and clinics open, we need to stop the spread of COVID-19. And so for all of those reasons, I'm sure this was a very balanced and carefully thought through decision. I don't think there's an immediate right or wrong to it. I think it's just a matter of timing and sequencing. And I actually believe over a period of time that we're going to be going to younger and younger age groups. Don't forget uh, the older age groups, those in long-term care facilities, those with medical comorbidities, were the very first to be vaccinated starting back in January of last year. So they're now more than nine months out from uh, their vaccine. And so they are not only medically at higher risk, but they also have the longest time since they were vaccinated. So for all of those reasons, uh, I think these were wise choices. Yeah, it sounds like it's just a very stringent process, as we appreciate you being able to explain, because there was a lot of confusion there amongst the American public. You know, we had a caller last week, and he had some questions about potential vaccine side effects. There's still people who are reluctant to get the vaccine because they're worried about side effects. But you wanted to follow up just as you promised him you would. Well, thank you for the uh, opportunity to do that, Christina. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of our callers last week did ask if we have been talking about the side effects of the vaccine, because, of course, we are recommending that those who are not vaccinated uh, at least speak to their health care professionals and then make a decision when possible uh, to go ahead and get vaccinated in order to reduce the spread of COVID. But, you know, if we can just look at a couple of these graphics, uh, let's start with uh, graphic number 21, if we can do that. Uh, this data was shown back in January of 2021. Uh, this looks at the uh, effect of the Pfizer vaccine or the uh, BNT uh, product, uh, which uh, was shown back based on the completion of their clinical trial. It compared fever, fatigue, headache, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle pain, joint pain, etc., of mild, moderate, and severe levels of placebo uh, versus those that were vaccinated, showing unquestionably that fatigue and headache are the most common side effects, although a sore arm certainly factors into that. I guess if anybody gets poked in the arm with a needle, uh, your arm will be sore. Then after the vaccine were rolled out, we looked at the side effects of the so-called systemic side effects in the next graphic, 
uh, about uh, mid-April. Now, unlike based on a clinical trial, this had about 750,000 individuals that received the Pfizer mRNA one dose and another 235,000 that received two doses and looked at injection site pain, which of course was the most common uh, in the first, second, third, and fourth days after injection, looked at fatigue, headache, muscle pain, chills, uh, and other side effects, as well as individuals that had nothing. And based on over a million injections, uh, this did confirm the safety of the vaccines. And then finally, uh, in this last of the three graphics I wanted to share with our audience tonight, uh, when the Food and Drug Administration approved the uh, Pfizer vaccine for our younger kids, for the 12 to 15 year age group, the questions were asked, well, is the vaccine non-serious and serious effects uh, similar to the older age groups? And so we were able to pull some data uh, from the VAERS registry, which is the vaccine reaction registry that the CDC has, for those individuals 12 to 15 years of age compared to the next decade, the 16 to 25 year olds. And this, of course, demonstrates uh, that there were uh, roughly a small, much small number of non-serious effects and, uh, frankly, half the percentage of serious effects of the vaccine uh, in this younger uh, age group. And this was based on about 1,500 younger patients who received it. This was from their trial, of course, through May 31st, 2021, uh, compared to over 10,000 of the 16 to 25-year-olds. And so, uh, you know, first of all, I want to say that I really appreciate the question last week and unfortunately didn't have the graphics to pull up. But I did want to uh, reinforce the fact that we really, really appreciate our audience call-ins, the questions that you ask, and we're committed, and I'm personally committed, as I'm sure you know, uh, to try to give you the very best scientific data we can give you at any time. And we so appreciate that about you. Every week you're here for us, Dr. Gold. On that note, it's time to open up our phone lines and let you join the conversation. 877-731-6733 is the number to call in with your questions or even share your experiences. When we come back, Nate Kaufman, the vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, will be here to talk about the health of our economy and answer your questions. One more time, that number is 877-731-6733. We're glad you're with us tonight. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome tonight's special guest, Nathan Kaufman, the Vice President and Omaha Branch Executive of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. In his role as the bank's lead economist, he provides strategic direction and oversight for the Omaha Branch as well as regional research and economic outreach. He's a very important part of the economic puzzle that we've all been faced with. He is the one who really makes the big decisions. And so we are so privileged to have you on our show tonight. Nate, let's get right to it since you hold a literal wealth of information for our audience. Many are concerned about increasing interest rates. Higher inflation, also a big topic right now as the result of the pandemic. But what should our viewers keep in mind before making any big financial decisions? Well, Christina, thanks for having me on tonight. I, I appreciate being part of the program. It's important for us at the Kansas City Fed to be able to interact with the public and share information. But we also do learn from the questions that are asked, so I appreciate the opportunity to join. And we know in interacting with the public that there have been a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, a lot of things that people are observing as they go to the store, as they go out in various places as it relates to prices and thinking about interest rates. And I think my first comment would be to simply underscore making sure that you're finding opportunities to have conversations about what you're experiencing. And so finding opportunities to talk with your family, talk with friends about what you're, what you're thinking in terms of future plans. Um, now may be as good a time as any to make a budget if you haven't had one. Some of those may prompt conversations that are important in recognition of a lot of the things that you're describing that are quite uncertain 
Um, and so I think that could be a first step simply to try to get on the same page. It may be that it's a good time to go back to work, or it may be that there's other things that ultimately come about because of some of those conversations. Yeah, everybody's economic situation is different. Now, Dr. Gold just went over the latest case data. With the pandemic having roared back with the surge of the Delta variant, how has the latest wave impacted our economic recovery and the future outlook? Well, I was reflecting on this actually having been on the program, I think last in February, and that was a time when we really were quite concerned about the pace of economic activity at that point. There was some optimism at the time that vaccinations and widespread vaccinations would lead to an increase in activity. And we actually have seen that. We did see the economy pull back a little bit. And as Dr. Gold described, connected to the Delta variant, certainly those businesses that are more dependent on consumers being in person or together in, in closer interactions. We saw some of those businesses pull back a bit. But for the most part, we've continued to see economic activity advance at a quite healthy pace. And so there is support for a more optimistic view as we've seen some of that uh, reopening story emerge. All right. Well, the future is very uncertain. I can't imagine how hard it is to do your job. We're going to go to the phones now and bring in some callers into our conversation tonight. Eugene of Ohio, you're first up. Go right ahead. Yes. Uh, are you there, doctor? Yes, I sure am, Eugene. Okay, I've been using, um, I have not been vaccinated, but I have been using Exlear nasal spray. And uh, I did some research online with it and saw that the University of Utah and Northwestern University did some research on it and found it to be very effective in stopping the, vac stopping the flu from sticking to the mucus in your nose. And also, they said, it kills the virus on contact. I just wondered if you have, uh, if you're familiar with that product and if you have any comments on it. Well, I appreciate the question. And uh, I have seen some of the reports regarding influenza, regarding flu virus. I have not seen anything regarding COVID-19. But the uh, presumption here is that the vaccines will prevent the infection. Uh, these topical treatments uh, res result in ways to mitigate the spread, to reduce the spread, and of course, to reduce the invasiveness of it. But the vaccines seem to be enduring uh, at a very effective rate and seem to be safe. So, you know, I would say, Eugene, while, while the vaccines are not perfect, the recommendation still strongly would be uh, to use the vaccines, possibly complemented by other types of precautions, which could include some topical sprays, which could, of course, include masking, keeping your hands clean, avoiding large groups of people, and all the things uh, that we know that are useful. Now, having said that, there are some oral drugs that have been under development now from several of the major manufacturers, and we're doing several of those clinical trials here in Nebraska as well, that appear to be extremely effective both in treating mild early cases of COVID, but also possibly being useful for high risk exposures. That is to say, if you were to have dinner, let's say with a friend or a family member, hopefully fully vaccinated, but unfortunately turned out to have COVID, uh, and you were very concerned about the fact that you were uh, either incompletely vaccinated or not vaxxed at all, uh, some of these medications might be able to prevent you from getting infected with this highly contagious uh, Delta variant. Uh, these clinical trials are in various stages of completion. Several will go to the Food and Drug Administration over the next weeks to months, and hopefully uh, there will be access to some of these oral medications uh, for individuals of all ages. But uh, right now, without a doubt, the vaccines are the most potent tool we have to stop serious infection, to keep people out of hospitals, and to flatten the curve of death that we're seeing across the United States. Science does prove that the vaccines save lives. Thank you for that call, Eugene from Ohio. We really appreciate it. And that's the beauty of this show. Any question that you have, 
go ahead and bring it to Dr. Gold and he will give you the science behind his answer. That's what he's here for. That's why we're doing this show every single week. And that leaves a line open for you. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're going to go to Texas to talk to Kathy tonight. Thanks for joining us, Kathy. Go right ahead. Oh, thank you. Yes, I would like to ask uh, the doctor to address some of the actual side effects. I've heard that there's been over like 9,000 deaths from the vaccine and other types of side effects, and I was just wondering if he could address that, please. Sure, Kathy, and I appreciate the question as well. Uh, the issue that I think you're referring to is that there are data registries that look at all people, all ages, <clears throat> all comorbidities who get the vaccine and then within a certain number of days following the vaccine pass away for one reason or another. And uh, while there's a very, very, very small number that do pass away uh, from vaccine-related illnesses, we've talked extensively on this program about the clotting abnormality that was seen with one of the virus vectors vaccines, meaning the AstraZeneca uh, and the J&J Janssen product. We've talked a bit about the myocarditis or the cardiac inflammation that has been seen with some of the mRNA vaccines, meaning the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. The overwhelming number of individuals in the data registry that you refer to, Kathy, are individuals that either passed away from natural causes some may have been involved, for instance, in a motor vehicle accident. Others may have had a heart attack or a stroke. But they were within the window that they were vaccinated. And therefore, the medical professions reported them uh, to the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention. So in a sense, some of those multi-thousand numbers are uh, unfortunately uh, artifactually connected to the vaccines. However, let's not lose sight of the fact that one out of every 500 Americans have died due to COVID in the last 18 months. I mean, that is an astounding statistic. And uh, over 600,000 uh, people have lost their lives. So, you know, the risk-benefit ratio of the vaccines clearly, clearly favors uh, the use of the vaccines, particularly in people in older ages, particularly in people with comorbidities, et cetera. And if were that not enough, Kathy, uh, there's data now that looks at the younger age group, those uh, individuals under age 12, and it looks at the prevalence of what we call long haul syndrome. And those are the kids uh, who are infected with COVID who then will go on for one, three, six, ten months uh, with fatigue, lightheadedness, irregular heartbeats, headaches, inability to concentrate, what they've called brain fog. And, you know, that's as many as one out of every ten kids uh, that gets infected. And those numbers are even higher in older individuals uh, because of the nature of the, vac of the uh, infection. And so for all of those reasons, the risk-benefit ratio to the very best that we understand it today, and I'm not saying it won't change as time goes on because, you know, the only thing we know about this viral pandemic is that it's not going to be the last and that this darn virus keeps throwing us curveballs. But as of today, our best advice is that the risk-benefit ratio of getting vaccinated strongly favors the safety and the successful outcomes of our vaccines. But we really appreciate that call. That was a great question, Kathy, from Texas. So thank you for calling in. And we're going to go back to the phones in just a moment. But I want to bring Nate back into the conversation for a moment because we have to expect the unexpected. That's what we've seen with the virus. That's what we've seen with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I mean, it's been in record territory throughout mm -hmm. the pandemic. And in order to make good forecasts, you need reliable information. So I do wonder... How much of our economy is actually based upon forecasts and how hard has your job been with the unexpected variables that have been at play over the last couple of years? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and certainly we've devoted a lot of resources to better understanding how people across the economy have been affected by the pandemic the last 18 months or so. We've been talking to as many people from a diverse set of industries, diverse regions as we can. And that's also then combined with data that we would use and, and try to develop some of our own forecasts. 
sometimes the forecasts paint a certain picture, but then interacting with other people, we get a different picture. And so for us, a big part of our job has simply been trying to interact with as many people as we can to get the variety of some of those perspectives across the region. You know, we've spoken with you and with Esther George, of course. We love when she joins us, the president of the Kansas City Fed, on what the Fed has been doing to alleviate that stress during the pandemic. What do you think has worked best for you and what can the Fed do to improve conditions now? Well, some of the Fed's traditional tools would simply be trying to address, adjust interest rates in a way that would provide broad support for the economy. It is a very blunt tool. The Federal Reserve's toolkit is typically not one that tries to go in with a lot of precision to certain areas. Those are things that are sometimes better left to other sorts of policies, but simply trying to provide the broad economic conditions that would be supportive of a recovery. And so I think those are still some of the tools that are, that are really positioned best. But sometimes coming up with the best policies, like I said, also entail making sure that we're having the right conversations and making sure that we are getting the best information that we can from as many places as we can. I think the American public as a whole is quite impressed with Jerome Powell and what you have all done at the Federal Reserve to alleviate some of the stress that we could have felt. We know it could have been a lot worse even up until now. OK, we're going to go back to the phones. Percy from Ohio joins the conversation. Thanks for joining us, Percy. Go right ahead. Percy? No? OK. Dr. Gold, I did want to ask you, you touched on this a little bit earlier about these new oral therapeutics. Some have really been causing a stir in the media. Some actually show quite a bit of promise. But is that reason alone to not get vaccinated just because we are seeing more promising therapeutics available on the market or hoping to see them on the market soon? Well, I don't think so. Uh, there is little question that the vaccines produce uh, enduring effect. These, these new therapeutics are particularly effective for early cases of, of test positive COVID, uh, and they are, may be uh, important, as I said earlier, for people that have had a high risk exposure to COVID, had a meal or some other interaction with somebody that ultimately tested positive for COVID. But the enduring effect of the vaccines is going to be critically important and the safest thing we can do. Okay. Richard of New Mexico joins the conversation. Go right ahead, Richard. Thank you. This call is for Nate. I have property up in Wisconsin. I was up there earlier in the spring trying to see about getting a house built, and I was told that because of the exorbitant price increases in lumber and metal, that I should wait and perhaps in the fall there would be a price reduction. So my question to you is, based on your vast knowledge, when would be the best time to try to build a house uh, at the most economical cost? Well, thank That's you, for Richard, you, for Nate. the question. It's, it's a great question, and, and the reason it's, it's a good question is because it directly addresses some of the issues that we're following quite regularly. Obviously, in addition to you know the path of interest rates, we're, we're watching inflation, we're watching supply chain disruptions. We hear a lot about labor shortages. So generally, the, the disruptions that have come about because of the pandemic. I think generally speaking, there's a view that as some of these disruptions start to fade, as we start to return to an economy that maybe resembles something a bit more normal, that some of those price pressures would also start to abate. It doesn't necessarily mean, though, that those prices are going to go down back to where they were. It may just mean that the price increases that we've seen here lately are not the same as what we've experienced. So, you know, in answer to the question, I think that it would simply be recognizing, you know, what are the costs that, that, that you see for, you know, making that purchase and how do you see the benefits associated with that? recognizing that there still is a lot of uncertainty about what we might experience with respect to prices coming forward. All right. Thank you so much for that call. You know, from a Fed perspective, how has the ag industry largely been impacted by the pandemic? And what are your greatest concerns for our farmers going forward, in addition to what we were just hearing about steel and lumber prices? When it comes to the ag industry as a whole, how have farmers been hurt the most? 
Well, early on in the pandemic, there were a lot of factors associated with the, the shutdowns and things that were affecting ag markets, prices that were declining. Um, that certainly was a major concern. We did start to see prices recover, though, and in many ways, income connected to the farm this year should look quite strong. I think the, the concern that I might have is that, generally speaking, in agriculture, as we see increases in commodity prices, input costs are typically close behind. And so some of the concern is simply recognizing that costs have increased in agriculture, profit margins are maybe thinner than what they were. And if we do start to see a decline in commodity prices, that would that would certainly squeeze profit margins. And so I think that it's, it goes back to the, the question that was just asked as it relates to costs. We're watching that very carefully because I know that there are a lot of farmers and those in rural communities that are facing those cost pressures that are very real. They are very real, and they only add stress to what's already been a very difficult time during this pandemic. We're going to go back to the phone, and this time Robert of New Jersey has a question. Go right ahead, Robert. Okay, well, that leaves a question for me to ask Dr. Gold. I did want to ask you, Dr. Gold, we've been talking about the therapies, the vaccines, and really, I wonder when we're going to be able to transition from calling this a pandemic to possibly endemic and then moving slowly but surely out of the situation altogether. Do you have any sort of an outlook as to when we might get out of this? Well, it depends on a lot of factors. I mean, I hate to answer your question with starting off and say, well, it depends, <laughs> but truth is it does. Uh, it has to do, of course, with whether there are other variants of concern that emerge globally that ultimately get transmitted to our nation, to our urban and rural communities. And as we've seen over and over again, this is a gl truly global pandemic. And what happens in Brazil or in India or in Ecuador or in South America uh, or South Africa uh, happens in the United States. And uh, we need to face that and therefore get as many people globally vaccinated as quickly as that's humanly possible. Uh, similarly, you know, we're currently vaccinating about between 700 and 750,000 shots a day in the U.S. If that's sustained, we'll get to about 80 or 85 percent uh, vaccinated, uh, you know, probably in February. Uh, and if we do get there, then uh, that will be approaching what we've talked about as herd immunity or the critical mass of individuals between those infected and those vaccinated to slow down the spread. So, you know, I'm hoping, uh, you know, unless this virus throws us a curveball, that the time period between uh, Thanksgiving uh, and the winter holidays uh, will be much closer to normal for us, although some precautions will probably still need to be taken. I've seen that a lot of our large companies, our multinational companies, which were planning back to the office uh, sometime this fall, are now talking either January 1st or April 1st of next year, uh, which I think is a, uh, is a wise choice given an abundance of caution. But I do think unless some other major curveball gets tossed to us, either a tremendous amount of vaccine breakthrough, a new variant, or some other parameter that we're not really aware of just yet, uh, or possibly even uh, a really bad flu season, which of course gets me to the opportunity to remind everybody that this is the time, particularly for our seniors, uh, to get your flu vaccine. But short of one of those things happening, uh, I think we're going to see a slow progression over the next uh, three to six months towards that baseline uh, that you've described. But once that happens, you know, we're going to be living uh, with SARS-CoV-2, the viral etiology of COVID-19, uh, for a long time. It is not going to disappear. Uh, it'll have a slow but definite course, and we'll come to learn how to vaccinate against it and live with it and hopefully not disrupt our lives. The good news, of course, is that all of the work that we've done on vaccine development, antiviral vaccine development, uh, and as well as some of the newer technologies for testing, uh, that will endure. And that will allow breakthroughs in cancer treatment, heart disease treatment, hopefully treatment of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and so many other diseases that afflict us uh, over the course of the year as well. So that'll be the good news, and hopefully that will be the enduring and positive effect from this pandemic 
as we move beyond the hospitalization and death rates that we're unfortunately seeing right now. Mm. You know, Nate, I pose a similar question to you. What key indicators are you looking for? When can we safely say that we're out of the woods from the economic backlash of the pandemic and maybe go back to looking at what are considered to be normal fundamentals? Yeah, there's a couple things, and we certainly look at a lot of different sets of data, but one of those is simply looking at, at how many people are back to work. And we know that some of the economic impacts that were felt immediately were attributed to the fact that many people were laid off from their jobs because many businesses had, had been forced to shut down. So we obviously track lots of indicators connected to the jobs market for that reason, and partly also because income that's earned from those jobs is then spent in the economy and, and tends to increase activity in other places. So we follow lots of things that are connected to the jobs market quite closely, but then also because the pandemic has been so focused on um, how it's impacted businesses that, that require close contact. We do also monitor activity and how people are moving about in the economy as well more regularly. Okay. We're going to go back to the phones. Before we take a break, I want to make sure we get Matt from Virginia in on this conversation. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Go right ahead. Sure. My question uh, is for the doc. Um, you know, we hear a lot of talk, uh, you know, with the vaccine and everything, but, you know, I'm trying to... to understand where the medical uh, professionals, you know, where they stand on natural immunity for those of us who have gotten COVID. And, you know, my, my wife and all three of our kids, we all got COVID and we've been exposed since and did not catch it. So what is the, you know, what what's the, I guess, the general thoughts on, you know, us having to get vaccinated versus our natural immunity that we now have? Well, thanks for the question, Matt. It is a very important question and one that is extremely reasonable to ask. And natural or innate immunity definitely is a factor for individuals that have been previously infected. Any infection uh, will cause some degree of natural immunity. Unfortunately, what the data has shown is that individuals that were previously infected, particularly with the original Wuhan strain of the virus, now going back over 18 months ago, uh, do not have anywhere near the protection that individuals who are vaccinated have, both in terms of measured antibody titers, specific what we call neutralizing antibody titers, and indeed hospitalization rates and death rates. So basically, in sequence, uh, the lowest immune you'll, immunity response you'll have comes from a previous infection, particularly before the Delta variant. The highest comes from people who are infected, and then 30 days or more after that were fully vaccinated. And in the middle, uh, but almost as good as the combination of infection and vaccination, are those people who did not get infected and are vaccinated, which is why the CDC recommendations are for all individuals, whether they've been previously infected or not, whether they've been affected with the original strain of the virus from Wuhan City, or whether they've been infected with Delta variant, to go ahead and, and get fully vaxxed uh, at this time. Uh, again, the risk-benefit ratio is very favorable to you. And indeed, if you look at the reactions to the vaccines, uh, comparing those individuals who previously were infected versus those individuals who were not previously infected, there are really minimal differences in the reactions and an enduring effect both on short-term and long-term immunity from being vaccinated. All right, we sure appreciate that question. Thank you for calling in. We are going to pause for a quick break, but we still have time to get your question in. 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again is Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And tonight's special guest is Nate Kaufman, the Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. We are going to go back to the phones. Robert of New Jersey has been waiting patiently. Go right ahead, Robert. Yeah, my question is for Nate, and it's, it's a financial question in nature. Now, I'm not a young kid. I've been around a long time. Uh, I'm from Jersey. We still have farming here in Jersey and things like that. We have the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank. But my question is, what is going on and what are we going to do with regard to money? 
and monetary policy. We are now printing money and giving it out in in a rapid like fashion. Doesn't anyone there at the Federal Reserve at any of the banks are aren't aren't any of them concerned about that good old thing that you got to save for rainy days? There's no reason to save today. I've got seventy thousand dollars in one bank. I don't even get a half a point on it. I mean, what are we doing? to inspire and to incentivize saving and and keeping people, you know, you have to be able to look to the future. What are we doing and where's our money going to come from in the future? Can't just keep printing it. Robert, thank you for the comment and the question. I think those are all good points. I think that those are definitely some of the things that we want to be aware of. Um, Looking back at the last couple of years, I think there was a recognition that because of the severity of the pandemic, it was a time to really put forth as much stimulus as there could be plausibly put forward, both on monetary policy and even on the fiscal policy side. But I think that your point is a good one, which is to recognize that, you know, there is no free lunch. We should be cognizant of the costs that might be associated with some of these programs. I think that now much of the conversation has been gradually shifting to how normalization of some of these policies might unfold. So it's going to be tricky. We've never experienced something like the crisis of the past couple of years, but I think that all of those concerns are valid. Thank you for that call. I think that's a question many people have on their minds. For myself, I have been a fantastic consumer throughout the pandemic, and I think a lot of us have been. We've been out there spending money and trying to save as well. I mean, it has been difficult, but I think that when we get those GDP numbers coupled with the unemployment numbers that we have been receiving, I mean, maybe you can tell me and you can tell the rest of the audience as well, Nate, do we have to have major concerns right now or what is the outlook, generally speaking? You know, the GDP numbers are going to show growth probably for 2021 somewhere in the vicinity of 6%, which is quite high relative to where we had been prior to the pandemic. That's probably not a pace that can be sustained and to the point of the previous caller. Um, Certainly some of the things that we pay attention to, though, are inflation specifically. If for some reason we were starting to see growth being quite high, but inflation is persistent, then we would start to get especially concerned about some of those policies that had been put in place. For the time being, it seems like economic activity is quite strong. Going forward, we're going to need to be thinking more about how some of the structure of the economy is positioned, um, you know, so that some of those some of that pace can be be maintained, but probably not at the pace of six percent. OK, we'll just have to see where we go from here. All right, Dr. Gold, a few minutes left. Do you have any final thoughts for our viewers tonight? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I think, as I said earlier, when we opened, the overall pandemic transmission and spread rates uh, in our nation are going down. Uh, We continue to see good news regarding boosters and vaccine uh, efficacy. And indeed, we're starting to see some flattening and reduction in hospitalization. But it's not a time to let our guard down. This is a time to redouble our efforts so we can pack this darn virus away. So let's do everything we can and hopefully we'll be able to put it in the rearview mirror. Many I certainly have... thank you and thank our audience. Yeah, no, it's like you've said, and many have said, the best route to economic recovery is everybody getting vaccinated so we can put this thing in our rearview mirror. All right, I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to make sure everybody's aware as well. We have a special show on this channel. It's called The Rural Americans, and our special guest this Sunday night at 8 p.m. Central Time will be none other than Dr. Jeffrey Gold. He has an amazing backstory. I want to make sure you get a chance to see that. In the meantime, wishing you and your family beautiful blessings from all of us at RFD TV. We'll see you next Monday for Rural Health Matters.